Good morning. Welcome to the Florida United Methodist Church. It's August the 22nd. Yesterday was fun in Flora. Today is Sunday morning. We're going to worship together. We are glad you're here. We'll have a song or two this morning, and we're going to pray. We hope that you will uh, stay tuned for the whole thing. Our world is on fire, and uh, today is my uh, sort of the official uh, day that I bring in to close my... Uh, 40-part series on the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we started this in November of 2020, and here it is, August the 22nd of 2021, and we preached on the, from the Gospels every single Sunday, and I just felt like we haven't even scratched the surface. About 30 to 40 percent of my preaching over the years has been from the Old Testament, and so we haven't done much in the Old Testament, although we have, you know, pulled out some prophecies as, as we've read through the Gospels, because Jesus quotes from Isaiah and from the Psalms from a lot of places in the Old Testament, and so we, have, uh, we haven't completely ignored it. it. It has great significance, of course, in, in the New Testament. So anyway, we're so glad you're here today. At the end of the service, we're going to have special prayer for our world. Of course, I'm going to pray for you, and uh, we've gotten lots of testimonies. We had a, the, the spirit move last week, and lots of things to celebrate, and, and, uh, and people have received uh, anointings and blessings and some relief and some healings and that kind of thing, and we're so glad <laughs> that they did because that's why we're here. That's why we're here. And that is our mandate. Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel. Yeah. And replicate everything I told you to do. We're going to look at that this morning and uh, preach through it a little bit. And uh, I'm going to draw from uh, three passages of scripture this morning. Uh, and I'm going to tie them all together. And so two of, two of them from Matthew. So you can grab your Bibles. We're going to go into worship. And then I'll meet you right back here. In just a couple of minutes, y'all stay tuned. We are happy to see you today. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. i 
Thank you, guys. Hey, friends, if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at the very last words of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, what we call the Great Commission. But as you look there in Matthew chapter 28, I want to read to you the first few verses of Matthew chapter 24, where the disciples asked Jesus, what's it going to be like at the end of the age and when you return? And Jesus gives what we call the... Uh, Olivet Discourse, where Jesus takes his disciples to the Mount of Olives, and they ask him these questions because the Old Testament prophets say that's where Jesus is coming back, right? He's going to put his feet down right there on the Mount of Olives. Every time I'm on the Mount of Olives, and I've been there many, many times, I just, uh, <laughs> I just think, wow, what if it's now? What if it's now? Wouldn't it be something to be there in that moment? So uh, you join me in Matthew chapter 28, and I'll be there in just a second. But let me read you a few verses of Matthew chapter 24. Jesus leaves the temple. He walks over to the Mount of Olives. That's across the Kidron Valley. It's not very far. It's just a, 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 you know, a, a 10 or 15 minute walk. And so he goes up there, and he's explaining to his disciples what will be the signs of the times before he comes again? And Jesus said in verse 4, Be careful that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and I will deceive many, and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be famines and earthquakes in diverse places. And all of these things are just the beginning of the sorrows, beginning of the birth pains. And then as Christians you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by every nation because of me, Jesus said. And at that time, many will turn away from the faith, and they'll betray, and they'll hate each other, and many false prophets will come, and they will deceive each other. And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold, but whoever stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a witness to the whole world, to every nation, and then the end will come. So you see what he says? He says it's not the earthquakes, it's not the, it's not the famine, it's not the kingdoms against kingdoms and the false prophets and all those kinds of things. He said that's just the beginning, false prophets, and before that he said false messiahs. And so those are really two different things. So. But uh, we see, you know, just deception. Just throw that over in the big deception box. But look what he said. He said, that's just the beginning of birth pains. That's the beginning of sorrows. He said, this is the key. And this gospel shall be preached as a witness to every ethnos, every ethnic group. Every, that's translated nations in your Bible. And then the end shall come. So what are we really waiting on? More wars, more rumors of wars? No, friends. It's that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached. That's Matthew chapter 24. Uh, the famous Olivet Discord. It goes on and on and over into chapter 25, giving the signs of the times and helping us understand about the time that Jesus shall return. Now, I want you to look with me in Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 16. And then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountains where Jesus told them to meet him. 
And when they saw Jesus, they worshiped Jesus, but still some doubted. So he just gives a blanket statement of some of the things that happened with the disciples. You remember Thomas and all that. But, uh, but these are Jesus' last words according to Matthew. And uh, Luke gives a similar thing, but he adds a little bit extra to it. And then Mark has an entire passage there that it, it's, it's so meaty and, and, and it's so wonderful that many people today, scholars don't even believe it belongs in the Bible. But, but I love this. So Jesus came and he told them, th this is his last, final, and great commission. This is his commission of all time. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always, even to the very end of this age. So go, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe, to do everything I told you to do. Wow, that's, that's a mouthful there, and so... I want to sort of help us get going into this, and, and I'll go as slow as I can and, and try not to keep you here for a whole hour, and I uh, know the last two Sundays my sermons have run a little bit long because I had ministry time built into them, and, and I didn't want to preach on something I didn't want to demonstrate, but, uh, but this, is, <laughs> this is sort of the ultimate, isn't it? Uh, the Olivet Discourse, you might think, is the penultimate, and this is the ultimate. And Jesus is really, he's with his disciples. You remember after this, as we read in the book of Acts, after he says these words, uh, he ascends into heaven. It's his final and greatest commission. And it's a wonderful thing. And so we want to just sort of dissect this. And the, the first thing that jumps out off the page at you is probably the word go because you know it's just not in us to go and uh, I have taken well over a hundred people uh, almost a hundred from this very congregation but a hundred well over a hundred people on trips all over the world in Africa and the Middle East South America and places you know and and then we send a lot of we send a lot of things and and I am a I am a missionary at heart I'm, I'm, uh, I, I probably should have gone to the mission field when I was younger, but I had some, some, uh, I had some genetic defects. I have a, a gene. It, ca it causes my skin to turn yellow right up and down my back, <laughs> right up and down my spine. And so that kind of thing, I, I, I was afraid to fly. You know, I, I flew on my honeymoon, and then like 14 years later, I flew to, South America, you know, I just didn't like to fly, and, and, uh, and then I had it in my mind, you know, the devil just whispered his lies in my ear, and I believed them, but always deep inside me, I wanted to be a missionary, I've always cared about it, I've always believed in it, and even when I was uh, running from God, and I didn't even go to church on Sunday morning, I sent money to missions, <laughs> isn't that crazy, you know? Somebody, somebody like me who was just sort of a, uh, sort of a pagan and uh, just sort of walked away from faith and all of that for a few years in college and right after college. But, but uh, it was always in my heart. I guess I inherited that from my mom and dad because I always had a heart for this kind of thing. And, and so there you go. And so he says, go. And that just sounds like an imperative, doesn't it? You go. Like it's the verb, you, go. You're the subject, goes the verb. But you know what? That's, that's not, go there is not a verb. There are three verbs in this great commission, but go is not one of them. Go is a participle. And so uh, to make a participle out of a verb, you add I-N-G. I, I, I believe that's right. So it's like going. So he means as you go. 
as, as you're going on the way. You see, this is the great commission for everybody in the church, not just for those who volunteer to go with me to Cuba or Chile or Uganda or Zimbabwe or the places around the world God has called us, but he, this, is, this is the great commission for you. For you, he says, as you go, going to Walmart, do this, going, going to the beach, do this, going to Sullivan's grocery store in Florida, Mississippi, not just a handful of people uh, that have got the special call or an apostolic anointing. The, the word apostle means one who is sent. And uh, so not just those who have share in that apostolic vision or those who feel the call to, to, to go on a short-term mission or feel the call to go over there, wherever there is. But, uh, but you, and wherever you go, wherever you go, wherever you go, you are a missionary. So Jesus, he drives that home pretty good, doesn't he? And then he gives us three verbs. He says, make, and he tells us to baptize, and he, and, uh, and he tells us to teach and make disciples of all nations. And so the Great Commission is to disciple a nation, not just to disciple a person or a people, but a nation, an, an entire ethnicity. Go into all the world. In Luke's record of this, he talks about Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth, the concentric circles. Where you live is primary. You're a missionary. If you live in Flora, you're a missionary to Flora. If you live in Mississippi, you're a miss uh, missionary to Mississippi. If you're an American citizen, you're a missionary to this, to this country. And if you're a citizen of the world, you're a missionary to the Whole world, John Wesley famously said one time, the world is my parish. And so we have that in our Methodist DNA. We go into all the world, and as we go, we make disciples, and we baptize. That is, we bring people into the church. We bring them into the faith. Uh, so we need to be about that, and, a couple of weeks from now, in September the 12th, we're going to have a baptismal service right here. We're going to baptize people by immersion. Yeah, this old Methodist church, we're our pastor. <laughs> we got a swimming pool. We're going to put them in the pool. We're going to immerse them. Sometimes we sprinkle them. Sometimes we pour them. And uh, sometimes we immerse. And we immerse a lot around here. People want to be baptized like that. We're all for it. But you see what he's saying? You bring people in into the kingdom and bring people into the church. Make disciples, not just converts, but make disciples. Baptize them into the faith and into the church and get it going, get it moving. Right here in Flora, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Okay, and then he says this, and this is, this is where people get mad. Now, if you were going to get upset at this sermon, i got two places where you're really going to get upset with me. One is right here, and I'm saving the other one for later. Uh, he said, teaching people to observe, that is to do everything I taught you. Teach them to do everything I taught you to do. Jesus taught the disciples. The disciples taught the, the next generation the next generation teaches the next generation the next generation teaches the next generation we should be doing the same things that Jesus did and even greater things I don't know why that's controversial and I don't know why you get so upset when I mention that but but somebody will you know, say oh no 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 all of the stuff ended all the stuff ended when when the last disciple died and so uh, Jesus taught his disciples, and it was Jesus and 11 plus Matthias, and then Paul born out of season. So there's only 13 of them, and maybe they were to do things like Jesus. But now that we have the Bible, we no longer need the power of God. 
Somebody in this very church has argued with me till, till, till I don't want to hear it anymore. That, uh, that we don't need the Holy Spirit in our lives anymore. We have the Bible. We don't go by the Spirit, he said. We go by the Bible. But guess what? You don't go by the Bible if you say you don't need the Holy Spirit because the Bible says you need it. And Jesus didn't say teach the world, teach the nations, teach the whole world that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached like Jesus said it ought to be preached. And if you don't believe that, then just say you don't believe the Bible. Listen, so you say... People say to me all the time, oh my goodness, oh my word. People say to me all the time, I don't need the Holy Spirit, we have the Bible. What does that even mean? The Bible says you need the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you see, friends, the Holy Trinity, you baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Trinity. It's not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You mangle the gospel message when you take the supernatural out of it. Friends, you need the Holy Spirit to empower your life because Jesus said, teach the world, the whole world, to do exactly what I taught you to do. What did Jesus teach his disciples? Go into all the world, preach the gospel, feed the poor, cast out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead. Jesus, Jesus set the bar pretty high on that, didn't he? <laughs> Yikes. And Jesus said, don't you teach or preach anything other than exactly what I taught you to do. And friends, I can tell you that Facebook and, and Christian television and and Christian seminaries, they're just filled with preachers who say that we don't go by that anymore. That all that passed away. And our world is on fire. And the answer, my friends, is in this book. But, but we say because of this book, we don't need what this book says we need. How bass backwards is that, my friends? How crazy is that? What, hell, what on earth have we done to the Holy Word? What, what would Jesus be talking about when he said, as you go, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teach people to do everything I taught you to do. What would we be teaching them? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what my preacher friends, how they would answer me. They would say doctrine. What Jesus meant here was go out and teach doctrine. And friends, I'm not a heretic. I'm not against false doctrine or false prophets that we read about in Matthew 24. I'm not for false messiahs. I'm, I'm not for heresy. But friends, you know, you can study doctrine until you're blue in the face. It doesn't feed a hungry child. It doesn't heal a sick body. You see what I'm saying? You can, you can be right on all of your doctrines. By the way, nobody is. Nobody is, not me and not anybody else. Nobody's right on everything. I know your preacher thinks he's right about everything, but he's not. <laughs> he's not, and I'm not either. So, so is it possible that you could be doctrinally sound and be spiritually dead? Friends, I would say that that's not just possible. I'm telling you, friends, that's verifiable. <laughs> that's verifiable. And did you know that none other than John Wesley said that that was his worst fear for the Methodist church? It's not that we would go off into heresy. Guess what? We did, but, but that's beside the point. <laughs> he said it's that we would, be, we would turn into a cold, dead, sectarian religion. Wow. 
Man, that guy knew how to preach, didn't he? <laughs> Friends, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives to bring, to bring the power and the passion and the love and the supernatural miracles of God to a world that's lost and dying and crying out for it. Have you read your Facebook page lately? America is at civil war. I know, I know that Afghanistan is at war. But we're at war too. It's, it's, it's a cold war, but it's, it's heating up. And people don't know what's true. And, we, and it's hard to discern. Friends, we need the Holy Spirit now more than ever. Uh, atheists like Richard Dawkins, who's a pseudoscientist at Oxford University, so, I, you know, who am I to say? But he hates Christianity. You know what? Atheists doesn't believe in Christianity. But, but Richard Dawkins is not a run-of-the-mill atheist. He's like Christopher Hitchens, uh, Richard Dawkins. Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins. It's, uh, it's what, they, they're not atheists in the sense that they don't believe in God. They're atheists in the sense that they hate God. <laughs> See, that they both know. Christopher Hitchens knows for sure because he's dead. <laughs> but Richard Dawkins is going to find out very shortly. He's going to find out very shortly that there is a God. But what he argues in the God Delusion, his book, is that one day science, one day science will give us all the answers and we just have no need of God. Sort of a Friedrich Nietzsche kind of, a, kind of observation. But friends, we have all the science in the world right now. And we're in a civil war in our nation, in our churches, in our communities, over the science. Can I tell you that there's, there's a sense that science has served us greatly in the modern age. But can I tell you that there is a sense that we have deified science and scientists. We have made them gods. And, and the true God, the one living true God, said there will be no other gods before me. And he is not kidding. We have made idols of science and scientists. Holy cow. Yikes. I, I get it stirred in my spirit about evangelism and, and missions. And so in 2001, 20 years ago, I just I, I started, I got involved in mission trips. I'd been on a couple in Africa and South America, and I just, it was a stirred in my heart, and I couldn't find anybody in our own denomination that, that had a, a, a decent expression of that, that I could get, that, that I could really get involved in and uh and so uh if if it weren't for like roger cunningham and cecil williamson we just wouldn't have anything thank god for those brothers who pioneered the way but i started a ministry called scott carter ministers we got a 501c3 and all that business and got a little bored and we just you know we just we just put hundreds of thousands of dollars into the mission field Nobody has a salary. Nobody draws any money. We just pour it into where we pour it into. And the Lord has blessed our little, our little ministry. And we've been something, 38 trips, I think, somewhere around the world. We, and we do ministry in places we've never been. But I, I met a guy named Robbie Dawkins, and uh, Roger Cunningham introduced him to me. And he was, uh, had just such a unique personality and and so I connected with him. I brought him into Mississippi, and the great big guys, 6'3 and 320 pounds, was offensive lineman, I think, in high school football or college or wherever he played football. And, and then he winds up just in the Mennonite church, leaves Pentecostalism, goes into the Mennonite church, becomes an Anabaptist, goes to Toronto, has his life wrecked by the Holy Spirit, and son of a gun, I turn on the computer one day, and there's Robbie Dawkins walking. <laughs> I'm watching him walk through Afghanistan, wearing all of that, all of that garb, and he has Muslims with him. I see him in Iraq and in Iran and Pakistan, and I think, Lord, there's Robbie. Look at, 
I'm watching Robbie. I see him get pulled over by a police officer and somebody's walking with him with a cell phone and he's getting questioned and that kind of thing. They, they walk and they just see people who are hurting and he gets out of the car and he's riding around Afghanistan and it says, hey, brother, let me pray for you. <laughs> Lays hands on them, heals the sick, offers them Christ. He does it everywhere he goes. He's been right here in Florida, Mississippi. He sat in this very chair, Robbie Dawkins. So I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm just disturbed. And so I opened up my computer and I said, well, I'll, uh, I'll watch a YouTube video, but uh, they're too loud. It wakes Sue Ellen up. And, and so I was just looking at my computer and, and just the Holy Spirit, I'm sure it was the Holy Spirit because it certainly wasn't the devil, speaks to me and tells me to go on Robbie's website and make a sizable donation. I went on his website and, and made a donation. His ministry doesn't rise and fall based on what I give him, but I've sown into his ministry before. And so I, I sowed the, a seed into his ministry, and I just went back to sleep. And, and a few days later, I get this message from him that all hell is starting to break loose in, in uh, Afghanistan. And he's telling me and he's telling us what's happening on the ground in Afghanistan before it was on CNN, before it was on Fox News, before it was a national uh, emergency, before the Biden debacle, before any of that. We're getting, we need to pray because our, our churches and our Christians and the underground churches in that part of the world are starting to be persecuted. They're going to find these Christian pastors, they're going to drag them out and they're going to kill them. So I just sort of understood what the Holy Spirit was telling me, that I need to get behind Robbie in this hour. And it was before any of this happened. But Robbie has this crazy idea. He's just kind of crazy. You want me to tell you what? Let me, let me just sum up his ministry in just a few words. Robbie Dawkins, I go into all the world and make disciples of each nation and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost and teach them to do everything I've taught you to do. That's his mission statement. And that's what he does. And, that, and, that's, and that's what he does. And he's done it in Afghanistan. And he's done it in Turkey. And he's done it, in, listen to this, in Iraq. And he's done it in Iran. And he has been uh, disavowed by the State Department. They've called him. Even when he was here, they go, you cannot do this. You cannot go and do this. But he does. And then he does it in the airports. And we're watching him. I'm watching him at the Vatican. <laughs> and he's standing at the Vatican in in, in uh, Rome, Vatican City, you know, and waiting on the Pope to come out and wave at everybody. And he's praying for people in wheelchairs at the Vatican because he believes in this, because he believes that what Jesus said he meant. And friends, I know a lot of people just, I know, I know, I know by the way, if, 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 don't call it the gospel if it's not good news. If you're not bringing healing and deliverance and hope and life and peace to people, you need to call it something else. I got a, a preacher friend who preaches nothing but hellfire and damnation. And I said, I said, what have you been preaching lately, man? You know what he said? The gospel. That's not the gospel. You blow in, blow up, blow out, and... You hadn't preached the gospel. You bring judgment and condemnation and law on top of everybody you meet, you're not preaching the gospel. That's not the gospel. The gospel is faith, hope, and love. Friends, can I tell you that the world has enough of hate? The world has enough of, of judgment. The world has enough of condemnation. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
right? Everybody knows John 3, 16. Do you know what John 3, 17 says? It says that God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world because the world was already condemned. The world's already condemned. We don't need you to condemn it some more. We need some hope. We need some life. We need the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the risen Lord. Holy cow. What our world needs now, friends, is hope. It's hope. Well, I want Jesus to come back just like you do. I mean, I really do. And if Jesus came back today, I, I think I'd be fine with that. What, what about you? But you know what? I, I know people in, in my church, in my family, people that I love more than life itself, that if Jesus came back today, it might not be so good for them. So if you'll read 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter addresses this. He talks about what it will be like when Jesus comes and the earth melts and all that stuff. You remember that? And Jesus said that in the last day, scoffers were going to come. And they're, they're going to make fun of people who believe that Jesus is coming one day. But Peter said, Jesus is not slow to keep his promise like we consider slowness. But Jesus delays his coming another day, another day, another day. Because it's not his will that any should perish, but that all come to saving grace. Friends, if you belong to a church that says it's God's will for you to go to hell, you're in the wrong church. <laughs> You've got to go find you a better church. You don't have to come here, but you need to go somewhere. Jesus came and died on that cross so that you would not go to hell. If you go to hell, it's not, it's not on him, it's on you. <laughs> Amen? Come on, just let me tell you the truth. Just one Sunday. Just let me say it. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me press in a little further. I said the, the part where Jesus said, teach every nation to observe everything. Not just to get the doctrine right, but to do the gospel. Don't just be a hearer of the word, be a doer of the word. Amen? Come on now. We dug that out a couple Sundays ago. Let's, 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 that's what the Bible says. I know that makes you mad, but that's what the Bible says. Your Christianity is not so much about uh, your doctrine, although doctrine is important and I don't endorse heresy. But your Christianity is about how you live your doctrine. Because do you really believe it? As the great Calvinist theologian and teacher uh, Francis Schaeffer said, it really answers the question, how shall we then live? That's the question. But then Peter makes this observation. He says that, uh, that while we are waiting on the Lord, that we're anticipating the, the coming of the day of the Lord, he said we should be hastening it on. That's what the King James Bible, hastening the day of the Lord. And the NIV says, speeding it up. So, if you, I, know, I know I just caused everybody just to get so mad. I'm just going to preach to those who haven't closed their computers and stormed out of the room. <laughs> I just want to preach to those who've hung in. If, you hung in where, where, if you've hung in there with me this long, you're great. Speeding up the day of the Lord. Is that possible? I don't know. It's only in there once. But it is what it says. You can read it in 2 Peter chapter 3. Let me, let me lift this up to you. What would, what would speed it up or what would slow it down? The answer is found in the gospel. Chapter 24. Jesus said, don't pay attention to the wars or the rumors of wars or the false prophets and the false messiahs and the love of many turning cold and, and all of that. He said, those things have to happen. He said, that's not the end. That's just the beginning of the end. Jesus said, pay attention to this. And this is what he said. This gospel shall be preached, this gospel of the kingdom. 
Not the gospel of your religion, not the gospel of your denomination, not, the go- not your pet doctrines, but this same gospel of the kingdom of God shall be preached as a witness to the whole world, and then the end shall come. And if you're, if you're watching me this morning and, you, and you're asking, I wonder what, what Jesus is waiting on, may I politely say this? Jesus is waiting on you and me. That's what he's waiting on. Friends, there's, there's a whole world out there that's never heard the gospel. And we want Jesus to come today to rescue us because we don't like who the president is. Or we don't like, you know, uh, the inflation. And we don't like the, the political battles we're in. And we just wish Jesus would come today and get us out of this. Friends, you want Jesus to come today and let half the world go to hell? He's just not going to do it. That's what Peter said and that's what Jesus said. You, you, don't want to know, you want to know what the only sign of the time in the Bible that matters is or that you have any control over? This gospel shall be preached as a witness to all the world. And friends, I've made it a personal mandate for me and for the churches that I pastor and for the ministry that I serve and the ministry boards I serve on. They're all, they're all missionary boards. I don't serve on any board that's not a mission board. Can I tell you this, friends? That if Jesus is waiting on anything, he's waiting on me. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on us. Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness unto all the world, and then the end shall come. That's what he said. He tells his disciples, this is your great commission. Go as you go. Go into all the worlds. Make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I taught you. Teaching them not just to to hear the gospel or to believe the gospel, to give mental assent to doctrines, but to do the gospel. Oh boy, that's what he's called me to. That's what he's called you to. You say, what if I go on a mission trip? What if I go to Cuba or Chile or India or Afghanistan with Robbie Dawkins or Pakistan with Leif Haitlin? What if I go over there and die? Friends, you're going to die. Everybody dies. Everybody dies. Make your death count. Make your life count and make your death count. Friends, I don't worry too much about getting people in the church to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. I worry about getting people in my church to carry the gospel to Walmart. (laughs) How about you? How about you? Friends, let's have a song. Let's get the praise band going. And I tell you what, I'm going to come back here in a few minutes and we're going to pray. And you're going to be so glad that you endured to the end of the sermon. That's what Jesus should have said. Whoever endures to the end of one of Scott's sermons shall be saved. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I think there's some truth in that. God bless you. I'll be right back.
so much. It's so good to be with you today. Friends, I'm going to pray for you, and we're going to pray for Afghanistan, and we're going to pray for our world. We're going to pray for our country, the COVID virus and, and all of the, the anxiety over masks and vaccines and that kind of thing. I just, we just let, let's just pray for the peace of God, and then I'm going to pray for you to be well, okay, to be healed in Jesus' name. Pray with me. Lord, in Jesus' name, I just thank you so much, Lord. For those who are tuned in today, Lord, I love my online congregation, Lord, and, and, and I know a lot of them, and some of them, Lord, I just may never meet, but I sure do love them. I appreciate them. And Lord, I just ask you to bless. And Lord, it, 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 there's a lot of conflicting information, Lord, and clearly we've been lied to by officials and, and uh, people in uh, bureaucracies and all of that, Lord, but, but Lord, you're the Prince of Peace, and so I pray for every person, Lord. I pray for those who've been vaccinated. I pray for those who haven't been. Lord, I pray for those who wear a mask when they shower, and I pray for those who wouldn't put one on for a million bucks. Lord, I pray for everybody, everybody that's tuning in who's listening today, Lord. I pray for them today. Lord, you said that uh, we're to let the peace of God be the umpire of our hearts. And so I just pray right now, Lord, that your peace would just rest upon us, Lord. Lord, I pray for uh, 
and school children and bus drivers and coaches and teachers and administrators and, and all the support, Lord, and, and I pray especially for the children and ask you to bless them and keep them, Lord, protect them from outbreaks and Lord, just watch after them and Lord, give their parents wisdom and what to do and what not to do and and Lord, I pray that uh, in this season that we would be, uh, that our moms and dads would become courageous and, and become more involved in the public school or the private school or whatever they're involved in, but that they would be salt and light and influence, Lord, for righteousness and for freedom. And Lord, I pray for peace and protection. Lord, we live in a very comfortable place but in a very dangerous world. And Lord, there is wars and rumors of wars, but you told us not to be alarmed because that is not yet the end. And we've always been taught, Lord, that when there we hear of wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in diverse places and pestilence and disease, that false teachings and false messiahs, that, that that's the end. But Jesus clearly said that's not yet the end just the beginning of the end, the birth pains, he said. But Lord, uh, you're in heaven, and you will remain in heaven until the restoration of all things, Acts chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, and I think 19. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, Lord, you, you said we are to look for and to hasten the coming of the day of the Lord. And Lord, we don't know how in the world we could possibly obey that, Lord, because we don't know that it's such a, a cryptic verse, Lord. And, it, and Lord, we, we don't know. But, but there's one thing we can do, Lord, and that is to preach this gospel of the kingdom as a witness to every nation, every ethnos, every ethnicity. And then the end shall come. And so Lord we take a look at this great commission this last and final commission that Jesus gave and we look at Matthew's version and Mark's version is more detailed and, and Luke gives us a little bit more tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit and tells us that we'll be his witnesses in Jerusalem Judea, Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. But Lord ah uh, we want to be faithful to that. And Lord, uh, we, we would be less inclined to go to the ends of the earth if we would be more inclined to go here. But Lord, we're not inclined to go here, and so it makes us more inclined to, to, to give a couple of dollars to a foreign missionary and think that we've done what you wanted us to do when the mission is here and beyond and beyond and beyond and beyond. So Lord, I pray that those who come behind us will, will have found us to be faithful. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name, Lord, for Afghanistan. I pray for Robbie and, and for Leif and those people we know that go in to those places and it, right into the center of that, Lord, and they bring your gospel and, and they minister to the sick and they cast out demons and they raise the dead and, and th their disciples and their followers, the churches, the underground churches, the secret churches, and that, that Christian churches that meet throughout the Middle East, Lord, they're, they're uh, reviled and, and martyred frequently, Lord. And Lord, we, we sit comfortably here, but Lord, our hearts are breaking there. And Lord, we see the persecution coming on the church in Cuba like I've never seen it before in my adult life. And so Lord, we pray for Cuba. And Lord, we pray for the world. And we just ask you to bless. Lord, we ask you to give us, grant us wisdom and grant us courage. As the hymn says, grant us wisdom and grant us courage, Lord. Lord, put on us a generous spirit, Lord, that we can support, that we can know that the people who are being martyred all over the world are not just 
some foreign nationals that got crossways with a government somehow, Lord, but they are brothers and sisters of ours who are being persecuted for the gospel of the kingdom. Help us, Lord, to see that and help us to respond in the best way possible, Lord. And finally, Lord, I pray, Lord, there are people who are sitting at home and they're in the hospital or nursing home or they're at their house and they're watching this, Lord, on this Sunday morning or maybe it's a few days later. They're not watching this with me right now, but they're watching it eventually. And it's hard for them to think about Afghanistan because uh, of how they're suffering right now. They're suffering here, Lord. Cancer. Uh, uh, heart disease. Uh, lung disease. COVID. Uh, the, uh, the breather, that breathing machine that they... Uh, put on people, Lord, it's just it's such a tough thing to hear that the person that you love so much is, is on a respirator. So, Lord, I pray, I pray for that one, that one, Lord, and there, there are many, there are a couple hundred maybe this morning who are watching this, and they're thinking, I hate what's happening in Afghanistan, and I hate what's happening in China, and I hate what's happening in Washington, D.C. But Lord, what's happening in their own living room is pretty tough. What's happening in their hospital room is pretty tough. So Lord, I pray for them too, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that you're a great big God. And you don't have to steal from Peter to pay Paul. And Lord, you don't have to withdraw grace from Afghanistan or withdraw grace from Cuba or withdraw grace from, from uh, North Korea and the hot spots of the earth to supply grace here. Your grace is in abundant supply. So Lord, we need some help. Lord, certainly we need help in the White House. Lord, that is uh, an egregious debacle. Lord, we need help in Afghanistan and around the world. Lord, uh, New, New York City needs some help. We need help in Mississippi. Lord, we acknowledge that. We acknowledge that we really need help. But Lord, this morning, we pray not only for that, but we pray for these dear ones. They're near and dear to us, our brothers, our sisters, our moms, our dads, our grandparents, our children, our friends and our neighbors who need help where they are right now this morning. We ask your blessing. Peace in Jesus' name. Peace, just receive it in Jesus' name. May the peace of God envelop you like a cloud. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, friends. One more Sunday. Next Sunday is the last Sunday of... Uh, August, we got five Sundays this month, I think. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll have to get out my Christmas list here pretty soon. And uh, well, we have a little token blessing coming to you in a couple of weeks. And uh, but uh, we got something good coming for you for we're combining Thanksgiving and Christmas into one gift. And you're going to be electrified when you get this. We are so blessed to be able to bless you. And so we love you. We thank you. You're just, uh, you're just, you're fabulous. Hey, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Don't let anybody, not your preacher, not your Sunday school teacher, not even your old sorehead husband or wife, <laughs> don't let anybody put you under judgment or condemnation. Jesus Christ has come to set you free. Amen? Amen. All right. I'll see you next week. Bye.